It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Mark Bailey today. He assumed the role of DTS Chancellor in July 2020 after serving 19 faithful years as DTS's fifth president, and he continues his role as senior professor in the Bible Exposition Department. In addition to his 35 years at DTS, he has pastored various churches in Arizona and Texas. He's published author and in-demand Bible conference speaker and preaching engagements all over the country and all over the world. His overseas ministries have included Venezuela, Argentina, Hungary, and China. He currently serves on the teaching team at Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth, Texas. He's been a regular tour leader in Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, Greece, and Rome. His current board services include Bible Study Fellowship, Walk Through the Bible Ministries, Word of Life, International Alliance for Christian Education, and Steve Green Ministries. Dr. Bailey and his wife, Barbie, have two, uh, have two married sons and six grandchildren. And I promise you this, after reporting to Mark Bailey for 19 years, I want you to hear me say this, friends. He's the real deal. He is still in love with our Savior, Jesus. Would you please join me in welcoming our Chancellor, Dr. Mark Bailey. Well, good morning. What a privilege it is to be back here. You've been studying, and I'm, I want to have a little fun this morning. So uh, all of you have a handout. I want you to just turn it over. Don't look at it. And uh, I'm not a prophet. Uh, let me use uh, my friend Walt Kaiser's line. I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I do work for a nonprofit corporation. <laughs> and uh, we want, uh, want to talk about leadership this morning. But uh, before I do, I want us to have a little exercise in leadership. And so uh, what I'd like for you to do is to, uh, to take uh, that sheet of paper, turn it over. It doesn't have to be as big as the chart on the front, just a small one that will allow you to put 16 boxes four by four, uh, one, two, three, four by four, and 16 boxes. So put uh, a little chart on your sheet that looks something like that to start with. Put a number in them like that. That's all you'll put in those boxes so you can fill it up however big a number you wanna put in there. Now the next thing I want you to do with it, and you're not allowed to look on anybody else's paper. This is a quiz. Okay, don't let your neighbor influence you at all, but I want you to, uh, uh, to circle a number. I circled two just to show you, but you can circle any number that you want. I'm, I'm not a prophet, but I am a student of influence, and so I, I want you just to pick a number and, and circle it. Now, whatever number you picked, I want you to uh, take off, just uh, draw a line through any other number on that line, either north or south, both axes vertical and horizontal, just to eliminate the rest of those numbers. You've made one choice, you've eliminated the rest in that line, either going up and down or across. Then I want you to circle another number, do the same thing. Circle another number and eliminate anything on that line, going up and down. Then I want you to do it a third time. Eliminate anything on that line where that number is, either up and down or across. And that leaves you with one more to circle, and would you circle that fourth one? Make sure you only have four numbers circled. Now what I want you to do is uh, add those four numbers together. Add them together, don't look at your neighbor. Don't let them help you, don't let them hurt you. All right, and to see what uh, kind of influence uh, you might have and I might have, if your number is 34, please stand up. If it's not, you didn't do it rightly. <laughs> but that's okay. If those who are sitting may want to take those who are standing to lunch and say, how do you do that? Because if you do that, you'll end up with 34. In large parts of American life, character and leadership, as Os Guinness says, is being replaced by image. Truth is being exchanged for power and plausibility, and confession and moral changes 
by spin control and image makeovers. Our motto at the seminary is preach the word. That's in our seal, Karuxan Tan Lagan from 2 Timothy. A slogan that uh, we've been using for quite a while now is teach truth, love well, which is basically rooted in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. I, I want to talk about godly servant leaders because that's a part of our purpose. Our purpose as a graduate school of theology is to uh, glorify God, as we just sang about, to glorify God by equipping godly servant leaders for the proclamation of his word and the building up of the body of Christ worldwide. And I want to talk about godly servant leaders. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul's on his second missionary journey, and before coming to Thessalonica, or if you were there in modern-day terms, Thessaloniki, Paul and Silas had been shamefully treated at Philippi, as Acts 16 tells us. And they tell us that Paul and his companions had been driven out of Thessalonica by those who opposed the preaching of the gospel. And according to the book of Acts, that opposition followed him on to Berea. And they had as their goal to force him out of that region to get him basically rooted clear out of Macedonia. F.F. Bruce in his commentary says this, that Paul and his colleagues found themselves repeatedly obliged to defend their motives and behavior against those who impugn the purity of the former and the integrity of the latter. In their defense of their ministry, as we have recorded in this chapter, we have a stark contrast between selfish leadership and servant leadership. Entitled kind of leadership and uh, an unselfish leadership. On your sheet, if you'll turn it back to the front, I want you to see some initial observations just in the text itself. You'll notice that the word gospel is found four times in this section. Four times Paul is uh, placing it forward in the conversation because that is the central core message of the ministry, without a doubt. And then in verse 3, we see how Paul and his companions said they did not approach ministry. And then in verse 7, how they did approach ministry. We didn't do it this way, but we were this way among you. An observation I had not seen before in working for this presentation is that twice the idea of who is witnessing or who's watching the ministry is mentioned. And so for the broader outline, it's God alone who witnesses how we handle his truth in verses 1 through 6. And uh, the second one will be God and others witness how we choose to model his love. How do we teach truth and how do we love well? And so as we begin the text, he says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, you know we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with the pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. That there is a right way and a wrong way in those opening verses. The right way is God-given boldness to declare the gospel in spite of and in the face of opposition. A second aspect of the right way is, a, is an incredibly deep desire to have the approval of God rather than the approval of others. That will always be a temptation in your life. But the wrong way that he highlights in this section is the danger of a loss of truth on the one hand and a loss of integrity on the other. The words that he talks about in the loss of truth, we didn't come to you with error. In other words, we, we, we didn't bring speculative uh, ideas of our own. Uh, the motives, we didn't come with impurity of motives. 
wrong kinds of motives, and, and, and we didn't do a, a deceit. We didn't come in deceit. The Greek prepositions there are ek, ek, and then en, and he's talking about it, didn't sor- it wasn't sourced in error. It wasn't sourced in wrong motives, and we didn't do it in a, a baiting, uh, you know, baiting way to deceive you. A loss of truth is always a danger. He said, we didn't come that way. A loss of integrity is the other. He says, we didn't come with flattery. We, we, we weren't slick. Uh, we, we didn't come as a, uh, a, a, a pretext for greed. We, did, we didn't mask our, uh, our, our, our desire for more by the way we ministered. And we weren't looking for the praise of men. It wasn't our egos that were on the line, popularity. The pitfalls of ministry not done God's way, error, impurity, deceit, flattery, greed, and human popularity. Those are always going to be potholes in the road of your ministry. But God is also a witness, as are others, in how we model his love. So I want to spend our time primarily in verses 7 through 12. What is it that we look for for a model of loving leadership? In their book, Everyday People, Extraordinary Leadership, I just love that title. Everyday People, Extraordinary Leadership. Jim Cousins and Barry Posner explore the idea that leadership is not defined by rank of authority, rank or authority, but is achieved, listen to this, It's achieved through everyday behaviors and actions. I don't think you could get any more everyday than where Paul goes in this text. The everyday examples that he gives us to inform us of what does God think godly servant leadership ought to look like. If you look at the chart, I want to fill it in for you as we go. We start with a model of leadership and then uh, what character Uh, or characteristics come into our actions. We're going to fill in these two columns before we fill in column three and four. And so, as you see on your chart, the first is, is a model of a nursing mother. The model of a nursing mother. He says, but we were gentle among you. And for you who are a little bit more advanced in your Greek studies, you'll notice there's a textual variant question there. Were we babies? an infant uh, among you, or were we gentle? It's one Greek letter difference, napioi versus apioi. And I'll let you look at the notes to find out which is preferred. ESV preferred gentle. Our friends who uh, did the net Bible prefer uh, like babes among you. The point is the same. It's a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, Notice the passion factor. We we were ready to declare with you, to declare with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Notice the terms of either infant-like or gentle, care, affectionate, our own selves becoming dear to us. I put three words in the box, gentle, care, and affection, that uh, if it's in fact, we became like an infant among you, a child among you, it's probably the imagery of a, a mother talking baby talk to her children. And you know, it's the goo goo, ga ga, it's we went that far to communicate with that baby in our arms. A mom is an expert at vocalizing so the baby responds. And those of us who have uh, children, watched our wives, or watched our daughter-in-laws, watched other people. When I uh, was pastoring, a lady came in, she was upset with God because she had given birth to a Down syndrome baby. She was trying to process, she was a smart girl, smart lady, young, young, young young mother. And she was angry at God, why, 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 why was her questions. And it's one of those you ask God for wisdom and you pray on the spot and say, God, I need something to say to this young woman. And and I'd watched how she had cuddled this little baby. 
Uh, she had done her research. She had went to seminars. She had gone to everything. She was talking about stretching a rolled up towel under the back and doing all of the early things that you should do as best you can. And as I watched her, as, as, a, as a mother tenderly caring for that child, I said, you know, I, I, I bet there's somebody else that would love this child more than you do. And she reared her head and she looked at me. I says, can't you think of somebody else that loves this child more than you do? She said, not at all. I said, so you're telling me that you love this child more than anybody else that you know? She said, yeah. I said, so if God wanted to put this child into the best care of someone that would love him more than anybody else in the world, would he make a mistake by giving him to you? She looked at me and she said, oh, you. <laughs> that, that, that gentleness, that care. A godly servant leader is marked by the sacrificial love in which the needs of the other person are more important than his or her wants. Godly servant leadership has the powerful effect on people's lives when they believe their leader personally cares about them as, and is invested in their lives, even to the point of sacrifice. Will that characterize your leadership? It should, and all of us need to grow in that sensitivity without question. It's, it's incredible sensitivity coupled with incredible sacrifice to take care of those that God has put within our grasps. The second illustration is a faithful worker in verses nine and 10. He says, for you remember brothers that our labor and our, uh, and our toil, we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. There's that message again. You are witnesses and God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. They didn't sponge off of the audience. They didn't demand their rights. They didn't uh, say, uh, I need more. You need to pay me more, etc., etc. We, we see in, in the character here both ethics as well, or, or effort as well as ethics. And, and, and the, the ethics is wholly righteous and blameless. But, but their effort is toil and labor. If there's a distinction between the two, one involves how weary one gets in doing it, where the other relates to how hard it is to do it. Kapas and makthas. Toil and labor, day and night, don't miss it. Burning the midnight oil. Moonlighting if you have to, to support yourself so that you can stay in the ministry as God has called you. Holiest character that's involved in being set apart by God. Righteousness that we're conforming our lives to the norm of God's word. Being blameless is not being perfect. Nobody is, but it's without a cause for reproach by others. If I've sinned, I've dealt with it. There's nothing for which you can point a finger and say, you didn't do it rightly. You haven't fixed this. It's a work ethic at its core. Private integrity is more important than public image. In the eyes of God, character always trumps performance. Integrity is the foundation for godly influence. There's a deep-seated certainty that Paul is mentioning here that he, he was entrusted with a message of divine, not human origin, and it brought a sense of urgency and conviction to all that he and his companions did. Godly servant leadership has a powerful effect on people's lives when they see the example of hard work that is grounded in godly motivations. My dad was the son of a trigamous gambler from Chicago during the Al Capone years. My dad's dad left his, our, our family, uh, his family, left my dad as a really young little boy and my dad did not know until my dad was 79 what happened to his dad. But he had married three different women without ever getting a divorce and was involved in a nefarious activity. And it ultimately turned out when dad was 79, uh, an old uh, social security document in the back of you know, the closet in a suit pocket, an old suit pocket, 
had the information that spilled out. And so at age 79, my dad went back to, to, to Oklahoma. He was from Chicago, but uh, they had a family reunion and all three families showed up. And my dad went back in order to give his testimony and what had happened to him as a result of God's grace. My dad was not a great dad in many ways, and yet he was a great dad in certain ways, like all of us. He had his failures, but the one thing he was, is he was honest in his work. He was a bookkeeper, self-trained accountant, worked for a gas company, a Christian school, a Christian college in the years that I lived at home. And I remember my dad taking the cash box from the football concession stand at the, at the high school where he worked, back to his office where there was the safe and he was counting it out to make sure that everything balanced and he was a penny off and it drove him crazy. My little mind, I said, I'll give you the penny, Dad. No, no, it has to work. He, he, he was honest to the nth degree and he was willing to work late nights if he needed to to make it happen. That had a profound effect and an example to me. I'll always be grateful. The model of a worker, holy, righteous, unblameable. Will that characterize our ministries? The third is a uh, guiding father. Verses 11 and 12, notice what he says here, for you know, and by that, that you know phrase happens about four times through here. He's putting himself at, you know, on display. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The character in action is his presence and his passion that's demonstrated in these verbs. Exhorting, parakaleo, paraklete is used for the Holy Spirit, that ministry of coming alongside to aid. An exhorting father, an encouraging father. That word is used in the idea of comfort elsewhere in the New Testament, only of comforting the faint-hearted in chapter 5 and verse 14, or the bereaved, as we find it in John chapter 11 with the death of Lazarus. It's that, it's, it's that uh, the empathy and sympathy born out of an incredible heart for those who've lost. And then challenging, charging. That, 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 that word is, uh, has its root in the word witness. It's basically saying this is what life is gonna be by experience and, and testimony and, and, and this is the witness that I want you to see and where I want you to go with it, the father would say. But, but I love these words, with his children. Don't miss that. It's the exact opposite of an absentee dad. It's a present dad, speaks of personal presence. To each one, notice the individuality. It speaks of individual attention. And those of us who have children know they're not all the same. They're all different, they're wired different. My two boys who are now men, who are my best friends, and their wives love them to death. If you sent one to his bedroom, he thought that was the end of the world. You sent the other to his bedroom, he thought he was in heaven. <laughs> just exactly the opposite, just exactly the opposite. One recharges with people, the other recharges in quiet. Just totally two different people. You can't approach them the same way. They, 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 don't, they don't listen the same way. They don't grow at the same rate. They don't grow with, for the same things. One came through seminary, the other one didn't. Ironically, the one that didn't has a, has, you know, has a passion for theology like nobody else. And he's always asking me theological questions. The one who did has the answers, he's okay. <laughs> no, he's a musician and does his thing in music and in the arts and it's wonderful. But I love this, he's with them, each one of them, but what's the passion factor? There's presence and there's passion because all of this is for a goal and that is that those kids will walk worthy of their calling to which God has called them. 
and in fact, it's a present tense participle, that they'll walk worthy of the God who is calling them to his kingdom and glory. So godly servant leadership has the power, powerful effect on people's lives when others are lifted by the vision and the mission that is bigger and better than their own private agendas. Paul had the incredible character quality along with those who traveled with him to say these are the models that we used in ministry with you at Thessalonica. That was his defense of his ministry. They couldn't charge him with error, deceit, flattery, ego, etc. Paul had in his mind these three models, everyday models for extraordinary people of leadership. For a minute, I want you just to fill out this chart with me. What do I get the value and the effect in the first one? The value and effect of a, of a, a model of a nursing mother who, uh, if, if it's a, a nursing mother came in with gentleness or that childlike gentleness that is uh, in the face of that child, it is compassion that comes out of a heart of love. This is the value of godly servant leadership, the value of compassion. I've chatted with our president, I've chatted with Daryl Buck. In my mind, I have a, a triangular paradigm for this engagement of our culture. It's gonna take courage, and that's the top of my triangle. But it's also gonna take commitment, that's one of the angles on the bottom, and the other is compassion. I'm gonna to have to have courage in the face of the unbelieving world to maintain my commitments to biblical truth and values. But I also have lived long enough to know that I'm gonna to have to have courage in the face of a out of touch church at times who doesn't have the capacity to show compassion. And truth without love can so easily be the end result. On the other side, it's love without truth. And we know that neither of those are an acceptable definition of either term. Full of grace and truth is what godliness looks like. Grow in grace and knowledge. There's the truth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The compassion that flows out of a heart of love. What's the value and what's the effect that I get from a faithful worker is that I get the concept of credibility. I get the concept of credibility that is uh, rooted in the incredible extra effort, the extent of effort. I was listening to a, a message that had been preached in our chapel a number of years ago, mentioned a friend of ours who is a pastor. And this pastor was working in a, a town not far from Dallas. They were clearing the lot and clearing some things and uh, he was in there, rolled up his sleeves, got the chainsaw and started cutting limbs off these trees that needed to be trimmed. And he looked around and all the men of the church were doing nothing but looking at him. And he said, uh, what, are you, what are you guys doing? And he said, we, we've never seen a pastor work before. Uh, they don't understand the effort that we know it takes to exegete the text, to craft and to sculpture the message. And sculpturing is the art of leaving things out, as you'll find out. You'll always have more than enough, especially if you've attended Dallas Seminary. <laughs> but what will the late nights look like? You and I have the privilege of not necessarily bringing our money to the temple, so to speak. We bring the offering of our gifts of teaching, preaching, and counseling, serving, ministration. So the question that I had when I was pastoring and even professoring here was would this year be a step up in my extra effort 
in quality and competency to bring that gift to the altar, to say, Lord, this is how I want to be a servant who can worship you today. What will your week look like in preparing a message, preparing a lecture, doing the background work for a counseling session, designing, administering, that work to which God calls you? Will it uh, reflect a competency that comes out of a work ethic that will commend you to your fellow laborers? Why? Because the last thing in the world Paul wanted to do was take advantage of anybody. We're not entitled to anything. That's the role of a servant. We've been gifted with privilege to do it our best. How about the guiding father? I love this. It's a vision, it's a commitment, that incredible commitment to a view of a future, a vision of the future. Like a father with each of his children, encouraging, supporting, challenging. There is a lifestyle that is befitting of a person on their way to heaven. That word axios is used of worthy, comes out of an idea of balancing the scale. Is, is my life living up to my calling? Is my citizenship reflecting my destiny, my homeland? If God is taking me to glory. Will it be future shock when I get there? Or will it simply be a step into heaven on my growth? Commitment to a view of the future. One more column. What's the benefit factor? What's the benefit? What happens when line one, a mother-like leadership, a mother-styled leadership happens? There's nurture that's provided. Nurture is that uh, what provides a atmosphere for growth. We're to raise up our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, recognizing they're not where they need to be. God wants me to love them like they are, but with the potential of where he wants to take them. It gives me a place of nurture. The second one is it builds trust. It builds trust. I know you'll do your part if you'll know I do my part, and trust is critical to teamwork in the ministry. No freeloading, no taking advantage. We pull our own weight, we bear one another's burdens, and we do our job. What you do when you're not alone is the 80% uh, of the Iceberg underneath the surface for the 20% above the surface that people will see when you lead. How's the 80% going to get developed? And finally, the value of the last one, the benefit is it creates hope. It creates hope. C.S. Lewis put it this way, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were those who thought most of the next. And those Christians, have largely, those Christians who have largely ceased to think of the other world, they have become so ineffective in this. I close with a statement from Bob Logan. Listen to it carefully. He defines vision this way. It's the capacity to create a compelling picture of a desired state of affairs that inspires people to respond that which is desirable, which could be, should be, that which is attainable. A godly vision is right for the times, right for the church, and right for the people. A godly vision promotes faith rather than fear. A godly vision motivates people to action. A godly vision requires risk-taking. A godly vision glorifies God, not people. 
May it be said when we're all done, to God be the glory, because great things he has done. Let's pray. Father, everyday examples of extraordinary leadership. Your spirit through your writer Paul doesn't make it very complicated, but its simplicity is profound in its effect. May these be our models because it best reflects the ultimate model, Jesus Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.